This, the humble boiler, has been the dominant technology in heating in the UK for decades. But we think it's time for a change. In the last 20 years, we've been told the solution is increasingly efficient gas boilers or perhaps renewable biomass boilers. And now you might be being told that the future is hydrogen boilers. In truth, we think, much like as it has been for cars, the future is electrification and that green hydrogen is maybe 10 to 20 years away. Now, Richard, it's great to, to talk to you today about one of our favorite topics, heat pumps. Uh, obviously the UK runs a lot of gas boilers, some oil boilers as well. We're looking to move to low carbon or zero carbon technologies. Why are heat pumps gonna be so important in that move? So Heat pumps are widely seen as a really important future technology, not just for the UK, but around the world as a means of getting heat because they can run on renewable and low carbon electricity um, and because they take a, a huge proportion of the heat that they actually put into a house or a building from the environment. That means that they can be naturally low carbon, um, sustainable and renewable, all of the good things. So for the UK, we currently rely on about 90% of um, on fossil fuels for our heating. So 85% of homes are connected to the gas grid roughly, about another million um, have oil heating. If we want to get to our net zero goals by 2050, so the, as a country we've got the target to get to net zero by 2050, to do that we've got to replace all of that oil and gas heating with something else. All of these millions of different heating systems have to be replaced. We know that heat pumps are a key option to do that. There aren't many technologies that you can actually use to produce low carbon heat. Um, and repeatedly, heat pumps um, have been seen and, and shown to be a cost-effective way of doing that. So can you kind of just explain briefly the difference between a ground source heat pump and an air source heat pump? Sure. So what a heat pump does is it uses ele electricity to move heat from the environment, so from the air in the case of air source heat pumps, or from the ground in the case of ground source heat pumps, or in, potentially in the case of water source heat pumps from rivers and lakes and streams. It moves the heat from the environment um, into a building, so it can be used for hot water um, or for heating. Now, uh, for, for air source heat pumps, they can be more easy to install. So you don't need to have any ground arrays, you don't need boreholes, anything like that. Um, you can put them on the side of a building, on top of a building potentially, uh, on the ground near a building, um, plumb them in, um, and much like a gas boiler, you have a flow and return, which gives you hot water out one pipe and you have the, the cold going back to it. Um, for, for ground source heat pumps, it is a bit more complicated. So you need to have some groundworks to do with the system because it's extracting heat from the ground. Uh, so you might have a slinky type system dug into the garden, um, or you might have deep bore wells. Obviously that's more expensive than an air source heat pump, um, but the benefit of ground source heat pumps is they tend to be a bit more efficient than air source heat pumps. So with a ground source heat pump, you get more energy out than you put in um, compared to an air source heat pump. It's not a huge difference, um, but if you have a big building or a bigger house, uh, it can make sense to think about ground source rather than air source. So heat pumps are more efficient than your conventional boiler, for example, but how much more efficient? So a gas boiler um, working at top efficiency will be about 90% efficient. So you've got one unit of energy going into it. 90% efficiency, you get 0.9 units of heat coming out of it and the, the waste comes out of the flue in the form of hot steam that you normally see. Um, but that's working at maximum efficiency in a really efficient system. In real life, a gas boiler is more likely to be maybe 80% efficient, possibly 85. A heat pump, however, uh, takes one unit of electricity and it can extract so much energy from the environment that it can be effectively 300 or even 400% efficient. Um, and that's something referred to as the coefficient of performance. And you'll see a number like a, a three or a four associated with a heat pump. And that just means that for one unit of electricity going into it, you're getting three or four units out.
Robert, great to see you. We're here to talk about air source heat pumps. I think one of the things I'd like to ask, first of all, is, is how appropriate are they for British homes? Because there are some myths and misconceptions out there. Maybe you can help set that straight for us. Yeah, no problem. Um, with lots of air source heat pumps, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is actually, can it heat my home? Um, will it actually work in very cold climate conditions? Um, these machines are proven in very, very cold regions, Nordic regions in, in the world, and they're proven technologies to work and heat the property up very nicely. It's that absorption of heat from this unit, so extracting the heat from the ambient air. And, and let's face it, absolute zero is minus 273 something. Um, it, there's energy in the air all the way down to that temperature. So to extract heat at minus 20, minus 25, it, it's, it's no problem for this machine. The best thing to do is to look at actually insulating your property first of all. That's, that's, that's the key thing. Get the house as insulated as well as possible and you're going to get a very, very energy efficient heat pump system. So it could work in theory with most different types of homes, but you've got to look at your, your, your insulation yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe and, yeah. and the thermal properties, the energy efficiency of the, of the house as a whole. Yeah, um, so this, this machine will give you um, 11 and a half, 12 kilowatt of heat. Wow, if okay. you've got 11 and a half, 12 kilowatt um, boiler on the wall, it, which is heat in the same house, it's, it's no problem. It's going to heat the same house exactly the same. So the coefficient of performance of a, of a boiler might be one unit of energy in uh, and one out, broadly speaking. With this, it's more like three times or, or possibly more. Well, this is the key thing, and this is one of the key messages I wanted to get across, actually. It's, it's all about design of the system. Okay. So the lower the water flow temperature, the more energy efficient the system will become. So if you imagine the best heating system in the world, which would probably be I will get arguments over this one. Underfloor heating at okay. 30 degrees water flow temperature. That's the key thing, is, is the 30 degrees water flow temperature. Okay, right. You're looking at a seasonal COP of five plus. Yeah, yeah so, so you put in one kilowatt. Coefficient, coefficient of performance. Coefficient of performance, sorry. So you put one kilowatt in, you get five kilowatt out of it, which is just phenomenal. Um, realistically though, let's talk realistically. Um, if you're changing um, anything on your house, and it's, it's probably gonna be radiators. If the radiators are may be oversized already, and you've insulated the house, so they're now even further oversized, that radiator might already be able to accept 45, 55 degrees. Okay. If you're hitting 45 degrees flow temperature, I mean, that's a rough ballpark figure, you're looking at a seasonal COP of sort of three and a half to four. So you, you're putting one kilowatt in, and you're getting three and a half, maybe four kilowatt out of it. And that's great, because obviously as we're, we're asking more of the grid with electric cars and other technologies, if we can actually make these technologies more and more efficient, uh, then that's obviously a, a huge benefit to the grid as a whole. Yeah, yeah massively. And I mean, um, even, even in your show, um, I noticed that you're looking at cars now that are plugging into the house to basically be able to give power back to the house, to be able to grid share. Um, we're looking at technologies as well within heat pumps to be able to, to grid share energy as well. So we can basically offload the heat pump when the grid is in high demand and then come back up. I and mean, even when there's excess energy, we have the potential to be able to heat the domestic hot water for a very cheap price. So for one of these magical boxes, yeah. you know, how much does it cost? I appreciate it varies, different price points, but if you can give us an idea of that, that'd be great. Um, I would have said equipment costs probably vary between two and a half thousand to maybe five thousand pounds. Okay, okay, and that's the equipment itself. And then what about the install and how intrusive is that as well? That's a very, very rough rule of thumb, <laughs> yeah. Um, you're probably looking at two times capital cost. Okay, absolutely. So if you're getting this done though, will you, you know, can it just go in or just you have to look at all these other things like pipe work and radiators? How involved is that process? That question's like asking me how long is a piece of string, but okay. um, effectively you could have a system where it's pretty much just bolt it onto the heating system yeah. and almost away you go um, to the extreme where you've actually got to change the majority of the radiators around the property, okay. um, maybe upsize some of the actual pipe work within the property. Um, and always, we always recommend that the cylinder is replaced because the likelihood is actually the cylinder doesn't meet energy efficiency ratings anyway. Okay, so if I'm sat at home and I'm interested in one of these, how do I kind of investigate it further? Do I, do I, do I get in touch with you guys and actually get you to look at the property? How does that process work? So normally what you would do is you'd actually speak to um, an installer. Yeah. Installers can be found off our website. Yeah. Um, alternatively, we're now opening up more and more um, sustainable centers and you can basically pop along to your local sustainable center and oh, they, they'd be able to help you with uh, selection. So you could walk in and have a look around and, and work out whether it's applicable for your, your, your home and your, your project then? Yes. Quite often when we talk about air source heat pumps, we talk about newer properties, but what about old homes? Can it, can it work in old homes? Yes, it, it can easily heat an old home. It's to do with how much energy you need to heat that old home. So if you've got a boiler um, that's 12, 13 kilowatt 
then uh, an aerosol seat pump like this one can produce 12, 13 kilowatt and it, it will be able to heat your home exactly the same way. But I think the key thing to remember is if you have an old home, the right thing to do is actually try and insulate it as best as possible first and then, then look at a, the heating source. Well, there's lots of options and we're going through them in this series, but I can see a lot of homes in the future with a, a battery on the driveway in their car, with a, a, an air source heat pump and with a clean energy tariff uh, and uh, doing all the work basically. Definitely. We're here to talk to Kenza about ground source heat pumps. This is the ground, let's go and see the heat pump. Great to see you, Dan. We're going to talk about ground source heat pumps today. Fantastic technologies. We love what, what Kenza do. But can you tell me, for the people who are kind of watching, what type of properties your technology goes into? Ground source heat pumps that we do can go into um, any property, really. Right, can okay. heat, heat anything at all. Anything that can maintain a heat loss, okay. yeah, you can, you can fit a ground source to. So what we do is we start with the property, okay. see how much energy the property needs, and then we look at what size heat pump we need and how much ground or space available we've got and then we decide on, decide on a, what type of ground we're in, how we're going to harness the heat from the ground. Okay. Um, in this instance, we've used a nine kilowatt heat pump, but as, okay. as you rightly say, there are three and six kilowatt shoe boxes that we make, um, and they're really successfully installed in retrofit projects, Fantastic. such as smaller bungalows, flats, and stuff like that. High rise flats are perfect, a partner for the Kenza shoe box, okay. for example. So at the end, we've got a nine kilowatt Kenza Evo, and that produces heating and hot water harnessing the energy from the ground, putting it into your distribution system and your hot water cylinder. Yeah. Okay, so we'll jump to the hot water cylinder next. Yeah. This is a dual twin coil cylinder, okay. Okay, which means it's got two coils in there and it can be heated by two different sources of heat. One from the heat pump and one from the solar thermal, which is up on the roof. Then we have the buffer vessel in the middle. Okay, And Kenza used the buffer slightly differently than other companies, but this is designed to stop the heat pump from short cycling. Okay, okay, so turning on that compressor, turning off, so it's preventing the heat pump from having a shorter life. Okay, so if, you, if you've got a property though, and you've got a, a plant room, that's great obviously, but some people could install this in a utility room or loft as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely, okay. yeah. So the most important thing really is where you locate the heat pump, because that's got a little bit of noise and vibration. Okay. I don't know whether you can hear I it. I can barely hear it to be yeah, fair. Yeah, they are really, okay. really quiet. That's yeah. one of the benefits of ground source heat pumps. but. There's no noise that will come from the buffer or from the cylinder. Right. So you could potentially put the cylinder in the cylinder cupboard. Okay. Yeah, up in an airing cupboard in the okay. property. Standard sort of thing we see with the boiler system. Okay. Or you could just then put the buffer in the loft. Okay. Or, or both of them in the loft. There'll be lots of people watching this thinking, well, I'd quite like ground source heat pump, but when do they start that process? Who do they talk to and, and how does that begin? I think most people would probably say they go onto Google have a look and then Kenza are pretty much all over ground okay. source, you know, being a British manufacturer. A lot of people that come to us literally don't know where to start. So it is like, what do I do? I want a ground source. And the first thing we always start with is how well insulated is your property? Okay. What are we heating? Once we understand what we're heating, then we can determine how much, what size heat pump we need and how much energy need we need from the ground. And then if you've got that ground available. And the way to get the best COP from a heat pump is to design a system that can operate at a low flow temperature. Okay, so when you think of a new build, it's a well-protected shell of a house. It's gonna hold its heat really well. What we put in a new build, because we're building the house ourselves, is underfloor heating. Yeah, it's a massive radiator on the floor, which, is, which allows us to run the heat pump at a really low flow temperature because it's such a big surface area. Yeah, if we don't want underfloor, that's absolutely fine too. They'll work really well with radiators, but you just have to slightly oversize your radiators so that you can operate it at a lower flow temperature. When we're operating a heat pump at a lower flow temperature, for example, if the ground temperature is 10 degrees and we want to run our heat pump at 35 degrees for the underfloor, we're only doing 25 degrees of work. So if, if you live in a smaller property, ground source heat pump could be for you, but what are the, what are the considerations in, if you've got a smaller property? So with a smaller property, one consideration we can do away with is the buffer. Okay. All of a sudden as well, the heat pumps are a lot smaller. So they're typically the size of a large microwave, something okay. like that. Okay. So we do a model like that that's perfect for flats and bungalows, um, can be easily retrofitted. What you do find sometimes is that they haven't got huge gardens. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of times they're on boreholes. Okay. 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 The majority of social housing projects okay. 
have been successfully retrofitted with a, a shoebox heat pump, a Kenzo shoebox heat pump, and a Sunamp phase change unit. Weather compensation, tell us a bit more about that. Every model of Kenzo heat pump that um, we produce, we send out with a weather comp sensor. Okay. That can be located outside your house. That picks up the outside temperature. And if it's slightly warmer outside, it just means that we can use slightly less energy with the heat pump. As it gets colder, that will then tell the heat pump just to increase in temperature, flow temperature, until we reach the desired design flow temperature for the property. So it can save you energy when it's slightly warmer outside. Kind of a loaded question of how long is a piece of string, but can it, can it be quite a quick install or is it quite a long, a long period of time it takes? It's quite a quick process. But again, it all depends on the build and the property. If it's a new build, it just goes along with the build. You know, they dig the footings in, dig the ground raise in. When they start first fixing the plumbing, they'll start first fixing the plant room. So the two kind of go hand in hand with a new build. But with retrofit, there's no reason why you couldn't start tomorrow. Uh, and how much can it cost? And is there any government assistance to, to help you, uh, incentivise you? Yeah, absolutely, because they are quite expensive, as we know. Um, they, as an actual figure of cost for a heat pump, they're going to vary because we do a big range of heat pumps. Um, I would say a cost for a system is approximately about a thousand pound a kilowatt. Okay. Okay. Right, just as an example, That's because a good rule of thumb, yeah. in yeah, as a rule of thumb, because install installation costs they change right the way throughout the country, really. And the domestic renewable heat incentive is still running till the end of March. Yeah. 2022. That's correct. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And but we don't know yet if that's going to be extended. We don't quite know what's going to happen at the end of that. Whether it's a one-off fee, you know, and that's paid to the end user, I don't know. But something has to be in play because the figures the government are talking about have to be achieved with support from the government. Well, if anyone from the government is watching, I hope they're, they're taking notice. I hope they are. Thank you, Darren. Thanks You're for welcome. your time. Clearly, ground source and air source heat pumps are great technologies for a multitude of different applications and different property types. Let's go back to Richard to find out more. So we've seen firsthand that when you come up with a new technology like electric cars, those technologies have their detractors. Normally people are trying to sell you conventional cars, of course, and we see similar things within the, this space, you know, heat pumps versus the boiler. It's often framed as, as that, and we think it's a bit more uh, gas versus electricity might actually be a better way of, of framing what's, what's going on. But if I were to talk to you about some of the things that people say about heat pumps, then maybe you can help us get past that. I mean, certainly one of the obvious things is in the depths of winter, uh, when, you know, let's say we move to a system where, you know, heat pumps are, are a commonplace site, you know, can, can the grid cope with that, for example? Will the grid fall over? Uh, no. So um, one of the amazing things that happened over the past decade actually is something totally separate around LED lights. Okay. So we know that there is a lot of headroom capacity in the electricity grid at the moment. Uh, National Grid have already said that EV charging won't be a problem. So we know that uh, that should be okay. Um, but this, because LED lights are just so efficient, they've, they've increased the headroom in the grid significantly. So there's already some space. now. Uh, that is not to say that at some point in the future the grid won't need to be upgraded and actually uh, that investment seems likely in any sort of future scenario we go down because we're going to be electrifying more things so we know that transport's got to be electrified possibly a bit more quickly than heat though possibly at the same time we know that we need to have a lot more heat pumps so um, heat will effectively be electrified using heat pumps and so the capacity of the grid will have to increase at some point. Now, I don't know if that will be in five years or in 10 years. It depends how many of us switch to heat pumps over that time. But at some point, I think everyone expects the capacity in the grid to increase. Now, this is something that is not unexpected in energy systems, particularly when we're planning for something like net zero. So we know that the capacity has got to go up. So the government will set the networks to invest in that capacity um, and the electricity generators will invest in that capacity too. Um, so uh, I don't think there's any risk of the grid suddenly falling over because we've added some more heat pumps because it's got to be large, a part of a, a bigger programme looking forward, part of a, a wider strategy about electrification. And we've talked today uh, about wind power as well and uh, in terms of there's about 22% I believe of, of power now coming from, from wind expected to be something like uh, 75 or 70% 70 by 2030. So how, how, what's the relationship between wind and, and heat pumps? <laughs> so that's quite a complicated question again. Um, we, we sort of know, and analysis in Denmark has looked at this, that um, it tends to be uh, 
that there tend to be more heat demand in homes when it's windier. So there can be a match up between um, how much heat we need and the wind blowing. However, it's not always as simple as that. Uh, and so I think the thing that often gets talked about is these um, anti-cyclone conditions, which is blue skies, not like today, um, but blue skies, not much wind, often frosty. Um, and I think they're the days and um, potentially weeks that could be most concerning for people. Something like the beast from the east actually isn't because it was very windy then. So that probably would have been not one of those sort of anticyclonic issues. There is um, this really big question in the future about how we overcome those drops in wind. So if we have a, a system that's very reliant on renewables and it's cold, there probably won't be much solar production in the UK, but there might be lots of wind production. Um, or or in if it's anticyclonic, there might not be um, wind production. And so something has got to fill in those gaps. Well, currently we use gas. So currently the electricity system is balanced by gas. So if it's sunny and windy, great. We've got loads of electricity flowing around that's clean. We turn on the gas power stations and they fill up, they fill up those troughs when there is a, a gap in the, the supply or a, a reduction in the supply. Something's got to replace that. I don't think anyone would say exactly what they think that is at the moment. There are various options it could be. It could just be that we keep burning gas um, and we have that as the sort of dirty top up fuel. Um, it, it might be that that's hydrogen. Um, so national scale storage of hydrogen produced maybe in the summer over the windy and warmer months that then gets stored somewhere and goes into gas power stations and is burnt much in the same way as gas is at the moment. Um, that actually is quite simple, quite straightforward, um, but just perhaps a bit inefficient. Um, other people are also talking about things like uh, liquid air storage, which is just squeezing air basically. And once you let the valve pop open like a bottle of champagne, you can then use that pressure to turn the turbine. Now, there is of course batteries to think about. Uh, and so batteries, um, standalone batteries, um, might have some value, um, but they're still quite expensive. So it's not clear that you could use batteries alone to balance the system. Um, I think there's some really interesting stuff around vehicle to grid. So once lots of people have electric vehicles, you've then just got batteries sat there doing nothing for most of the time. If we're thinking that you know cars get used an average 5% of their lifetime, something like that, there might be that there. But even so, batteries may only be able to do a day or two's worth of um, support to the grid. So something's got to fill that gap in. Um, there are various options, and I don't think anyone would say which they think the best option is yet. The UK has a notoriously inefficient housing stock. Um, heat pumps are sometimes said not to be the best fit for kind of leakier properties, if you like. But ground source and air source, they can work with all types of properties. But can you go into that in a bit more, bit more detail? And what if I was worried that my house is just simply too energy efficient to, to run a heat pump? So if you're worried that your house is inefficient, sort out the efficiency in the first place, no heating system is going to be working at its best in an inefficient house uh, and your bills will be higher. Um, so if you have a gas boiler in an inefficient house, not only will it be running at high temperatures, meaning it's probably not condensing, um, your bills will also naturally be high because your house is leaking loads of heat in the first place. So there's a huge role for energy efficiency in general um, in the UK. Compared to very similar EU nations, we're doing really badly on energy efficiency. Um, and that's got to be part of the same programme as we do the rollout of heat pumps. However, uh, there, I know of houses that have solid walls and are uninsulated and have single glazed windows with heat pumps. It's possible, you just need to make sure that the system is again sized correctly. So you need to make sure your heat pump's big enough for the job um, and you need to make sure that your radiators are suitable for the job as well. Um, so I've, I've spoken to various people. Uh, one example is a ground source heat pump uh, church, which doesn't have any insulation, wow, okay. um, but they've got underfloor heating. Another example is a, a granite Cornish cottage um, you could insulate it, but it would change the characteristics of it somewhat. Um, air pump, air source heat pumped. So you can do it, but it's about sizing it correctly. But if you want to have a really cosy house um, that is cheap to run, do the energy efficiency as well. It's a total no-brainer. So that's really reassuring. But is there do ground source heat pumps belong or work better with kind of houses with bigger proper, bigger premises, for example? And air source is better as a rule of thumb for smaller properties. Is that a, a generalisation too far? I think that's a good generalisation, actually. So um, because of the additional investment that's needed for a ground source heat pump, um, they tend to be better suited to houses with a higher heat demand. Okay. Um, because if you're using more heat, you want to make sure your system is more efficient um, than the alternatives, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
And so you might get this 500 or 450% efficiency with a ground source heat pump, um, but it's got a big high upfront investment, whereas an air source heat pump will have a lower upfront investment and you'll be getting an efficiency of maybe 350%. So um, it's really a balance. Um, as a rule, if you had a big property, you, you'd probably do a, a ground source heat pump. Um, if, so if you were lucky enough to own a big mansion or, or a detached house or something like that, ground source heat pump might be a better option. Not always. Um, and one of the interesting things to note is that the the efficiencies compared between air source and ground source are getting closer and closer actually. So okay. air source heat pumps are getting more efficient because of you know, clever heat exchanges and stuff like that and just better technology. So it, there is a sort of race going on. Fundamentally, it doesn't matter because it's all about using electricity and electricity is getting greener, um, but it's always going to be a household decision. So air source heat pumps sell well in Scandinavia, for example, so that probably answers the question about can it work in colder yeah. climates. But but yeah. why, why are they selling more heat pumps in Europe than they are in the UK? Fundamentally, it's about what the government's doing. So in Sweden is the best example. So Sweden's got... I think probably the most mature heat pump market in the world, despite the fact it's pretty cold in Sweden um, in the winter. Uh, and years ago, their government decided they wanted to get off fossil fuels. It was a slightly different reason, so it was the oil crisis. But over that 50-year um, period, really, so since 1970 all the way through to today, they have eradicated fossil fuels from heating. Um, and yes, it was oil, but it's not that dissimilar to gas. You know, it's, it's quite similar priced, easy to transport, um, burns in a boiler. Um, and they made a decision back in uh, the 70s and 80s and 90s, and they've kept it going, that they wanted to get rid of fossil fuels. Um, they made that decision. They put policies in place to do it, um, and they've achieved their goal. And so 50 years later, we're going, OK, we've got this climate change target. We need to do something. And now really the best thing that we can do is look to countries like Sweden and Scandinavian countries, and Denmark's a good example too, and see what they've done. And uh, as, as researchers and academics, we're now in a position where actually we're just basically saying the government needs to look at what other countries have done, where they've been successful, and just do it. Because clearly it works and it can be done. So specifically, what could UK government do to kind of accelerate heat pump deployment? Well, I think there are lots of things they could do. So currently you can get um, some support from the renewable heat incentive if you get a heat pump, but that's coming to an end next year. So... Um, after next year, we don't know what support's going to be in place. After next April, so we haven't even got a full year. Um, the government has proposed this grant called the Clean Heat Grant, which is supposed to come in, but we don't know the details of it. We don't know how much it will be to a household. £4,000 was mentioned. That's possibly enough for an air source heat pump to, to push you over the edge. It's not enough for a ground source heat pump. Uh, the proposals were that they'd only support a few thousand a year, maybe ten or 15,000, and that's just not enough. So there's got to be a whole package of measures to, to do this. Um, I think one of them has to be, you have to support households or, or companies in the first place with cash. You can't just expect every single household to pay the additional because we know air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps are more expensive than gas boilers. Um, up front, running costs are very similar, but up front they do cost more. And so there needs to be some sort of cash incentive to help them. Um, I think alongside that, there needs to be, you know, the world as it is today, fossil fuels remain cheaper because the government's just ignored the fact that there's a climate change price associated with them. It's, it's like not paying to dispose of your rubbish and just chucking it out the window. Eventually there's going to be a huge pile of rubbish there, right, that you know is an issue. You can't see the climate change emissions, but every unit of gas that gets burnt in the UK, we're just chucking that waste out of our gas boiler, out of our flues, and the same with oil boilers. We just don't value it. Um, and so at some point, the government's going to have to make a decision that says we can't keep burning gas. We're going to have to make people pay more to do it because you've got to shift the economics from gas. Because if gas main, remains cheaper than a heat pump, the, the vast majority of the people will not do it. You know, you'd only do it if you really wanted a heat pump. And as much as I love heat pumps, as much as you might love heat pumps, as much as your viewers might love heat pumps, it can't just be us that, that does it. It can't just be the people that care that do this. So the government's got to reshape the market as well. And then outside of that, there's a whole host of things they can do around building supply chain, supporting skills, which is a really important one. Um, all of these bits need to come together um, and you need a really thorough package because we, we're not talking about just making sure everyone's got a smart meter. We're talking about something much bigger than that. We're talking about 
going into people's homes, potentially requiring them to have bigger radiators, asking maybe for a hot water tank or some storage to go back in, and asking for them to have something like a heat pump on the outside of their house. And for most houses, that won't be a huge issue, but it's still, it's still a change from the status quo. And it's just, there's so much to do in so little time, it needs a real kick to get it done. Thankfully, things are changing fast. And since we recorded this, Octopus Energy has announced its intentions to cut the cost of an air source heat pump installation to 4,000 to 5,000 pounds within the next 18 months. Richard and I talked at length about heat pumps that can cool, hydrogen boilers and more, and we will share the full interview on Fully Charged Plus soon. But we went back to Tim Pollard for one final time to ask him about how the government accelerated heating efficiency back in 2005. Well, you know, we, we had all sorts of, of grades of boilers in the past, you know, and cast iron heat exchangers and whatever, and, and they ranged in efficiency over a huge, you know, fantastic scale. So, you know, a government plucked up the courage when they brought a rule in which said, actually, it's illegal to fit anything other than a condensing boiler. And the industry for the previous year had been go, oh no, this can never happen. It'll be disaster. There'll be, you know, people on the streets and it, it can never work. And the day came around, the industry all pulled together, I have to say, the manufacturers, the wholesalers, the, the installers themselves, provided and they got training happening locally etc that day came and guess what from that time onwards condensing boilers were fitted no argument and I'd like to see exactly the same thing happen today not in terms of a technology but to set a standard to say in EPC terms you have to achieve x whatever that level is and it is mandatory by building regulations to do that. As you know, there's a big shift off of gas. Yeah. We want to stop burning fossil fuels. We want to start using renewables. And electrification is, is the way forward at the moment. Do you think if your gas boiler put in one unit of gas and electric in to run that boiler? And only getting potentially one kilowatt of energy out of it. We still get that bit of waste heat that goes out of the flue. The CO2 output from that machine um, to actually produce that, that one kilowatt compared to electric, which is becoming more and more green. With a heat pump, we're putting one unit in, three units in from the ground, we're getting four out. So it makes it a very energy efficient device. We're quartering the cost of heat for our value for money. So in summary then, heat pumps are the way forward. Totally, and it's not just me that thinks that. The International Energy Agency and the Commission on Climate Change also say the same thing. Great, thank you Richard, really good to talk to you. Pleasure. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for in this episode, and we can't do justice to air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps in one episode. So rest assured, we will be back to cover those technologies in much more detail because they are, have a huge role to play in our homes in the future. We started off by talking about the humble boiler. In the next episode, we're gonna talk about not so humble, zero emission boilers. So in the meantime, if you have been, thanks for watching.